the latest in AI shenanigans. Uh, Shelby, tell us about it. So I'm glad you said uh, tale as old as time because this whole dynamic price, it, price issue basically is a tale as old as time. It's just people don't quite realize it, okay? Price tags are a modern invention, right? You go back to the days where you know, you're buying your goods from a little tiny shop, you're haggling with your shopkeeper. You're not looking at the price tag and handing over whatever's listed there, right? So the whole dynamic pricing issue basically comes down to that. It's not a new thing to say, oh, I may pay one price for a good today, I may pay a different price for that good tomorrow or in a different location or under different settings, right? The trouble comes in when you start bringing AI into it and when you start applying it to things that are daily necessities for people, right? So we're talking mostly here about grocery stores. We're basically already seeing this play out in what's called uh, ESLs, so electronic shelf labels. That's when you're seeing not a paper price tag that's put in place by a human, but it's something digitally changed from minute to minute, right? So it's representative of what you're paying at a given time. That's okay for the most part. We've been seeing retailers like Kohl's and other you know, shopping centers Airlines, again, like so many, many industries have been using this for a while now. But people are concerned that next time they might walk into the grocery store, they may pick up a gallon of milk, head to the checkout, and suddenly it might be priced a little bit differently by the time we get there, right? That's a concern for a lot of people. So here's the breakdown of that. Ultimately, I'm not personally convinced that we're going to see this as an immediate problem, right? Perhaps we may see changes on the day-to-day -day basis. So after the stores close for the night, then the price may change to reflect something else. Right? It's not going to be like the stock changing market inventory. where you're seeing fluctuations <laughs> and you're waiting a, there with your buddies yeah. for the price to dip. There have so you been can videos buy milk. uploaded where people are like, look, look, it changed in real time. Look at that, look at that. And they're assuming that it was because they were standing in front of it and they're getting another price. But it was probably just you know, poorly timed price I'm a change. cheap person. Perhaps, I, would, yes. I would hang out in the store for half an hour and just look around. <laughs> Well, here's the thing on that. So there's a, one grocery chain in the Netherlands and Belgium that actually does update very regularly, right? So specifically with the price of milk, I believe it's every 15 minutes that changes. However, that price change is tied directly to two things. The time where, like the, the you know, distance between present moment and the stores closing for the day and the distance to the milk's expiration date, right? So the closer it is to expiry, the better deal you can get on the milk. But that just makes me think it, 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 it's not actually affecting the milk price. It's just affecting the time that people shop in the store. That's, That's part of it. But I think the milk thing, like who doesn't, you know, reach to the back to get the milk with, you know, the furthest expired date, even though you know you're going to finish it in time. But if that milk that expires sooner and is still fine is cheaper, people are going to buy that milk, mm -hmm. actually. I don't, I don't think that part... That part kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, and it makes sense to me too. The other argument for it is, you know, you save a lot of food waste, right? If people are more likely to pick out the things that are going to expire and purchase them for a better price, right? They, you know, you and I were talking about this earlier today offsite, but, um, you know, maybe you know your family's gonna go through the gallon of milk in a day anyway, so you just pick it up for a cheaper price. That's great. The other argument is food waste, right? So, you know, perhaps stores may not be throwing away quite as much at the end of the day. That's Excellent, right? It's ungodly how much food, I would say, everything you see on the shelf, the equivalent of that will be in the trash, you know, in a week's time. Not just I, in the store, but in the household, too. That's another issue. But that, the, the, especially in the produce section, that's where I'm, I'm familiar. And they have uh, grocery stores, they don't get enough credit. They have, this is, do you know the, the profit margin of a grocery store? It's low. I know it's low. It's between 1% and 3%. Oh, wow. Yeah. So on all of that stuff, that's how much they're making. You know, so groceries razor are thin. one thing that... Everything has kind of got this dynamic pricing right now. So a few weeks ago, I went to a Yankees game. And so I was looking at the prices. And, okay, I, I grew up going to baseball games when I was a kid. The, there was four, four ticket prices, right? There's, you know, four levels of seating, you know, from field level to bleachers, four. That's it. I looked up Yankees game. There was 50 to 70 different prices. And that's not even static because it changes depending on, you know, what team is in town, what the weather is, you know, how the team is doing, are they winning or losing, how close to the end of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, it might even be within the section, how many seats are left, how close to the game time it is. Like, it's kind of crazy. I was shocked because I haven't done that in a long time. And I was like, what is this? The same is true for an Amtrak ticket. <laughs> That's true, you know, actually. Depending Sometimes they on, change it They real change time. it. If it's, if it's 15 minutes left, you're yeah. going to pay $200 more sometimes. Yeah. Well, soon we'll be using VPNs 
We're going to figure out which, like, if you're in Vietnam and you go to Kroger's website and order the milk, it's less expensive. You can do some arbitrage there. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, so, so this is a positive development, in my opinion, because it, it's like, it, it just makes the supply and demand of the market in real time. And I think as things dip, if, if you see like, oh, egg prices are lower, you just go stock up. Or if you see like, at the end of the day, the prices are lower, then the store can kind of line up when they have a dip in traffic and you can go there. I, I feel like this is a positive development, but right? part of the AI is also monitoring the competitors, right? So yes. that's going to be Yeah, stressful. so the AI <laughs> models, you know, there's a lot of data that's getting fed into this, right? Into this algorithm, if you will. So the, the components are, okay, what's happening in the store? How much stock is available? You know, expiry dates, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, you bring it back to the historical sense of like, you know, you're haggling with your shopkeeper, like, that shopkeeper is actually very skilled in order to be able to do that, right? You know what your competitors are selling for, you know how available the product you have is, you know the value of it, and you also know your consumer base. You see the loyalty of that particular customer. Precisely, yeah. What else they're buying? Absolutely. <clears throat> well, okay, so l l let, me, let me ask you, Tiffany. Do you think, okay, so the, the positive is obvious because there's like, you know, it's financially positive and it kind of like, you know, lets you feel the pulse of the market and then you can kind of, you know, you can know when the demand and supply, it's like more transparent than the market. But do you feel like, like with what Shelby was saying, that it's like taking more of the humanness out of it. It's like, instead of like a, 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 an old, I mean, a bizarre, you know, grandpa who's been in the market for so long, he knows the whole community, he knows how to price things out. Now it's like a faceless algorithm. How do you feel about that? Is it a positive development? Or, 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 uh, or is it a positive development that's masqueraded as a positive development, but it's secretly a negative development? I think it depends on how you look at it because sure there's like the convenience side right you can do a lot more and then maybe saving waste again to like with the little stickers if you're putting them but then to your point there is also the skill set where i do feel in general like even my generation compared to previous ones i feel dumber than like my parents and stuff just like the way they had to do a lot of uh, mental arithmetic all these different things right uh and then nowadays you're just like <laughs> when I was growing up, it's like you use this specific calculator, and not all the phones have calculators. We, we, we couldn't even do 5 million times 70,000. And now, you know, nowadays it's like, oh, if you say you're going to Google something, the younger generation's like, Google, you go to chat, chat GPT. You're like, chat, what's this? So it's like, it's gone to the point where if you're really reliant on it, what are you giving away? Are you losing those skills? So there is a study. I was telling you about before, so they, MIT has just released this first brain scan study of people using chat GTP type, you know, language learning models. And they had people, they, they followed, I can't remember, for four weeks, um, what do they do? 54 participants for four months, sorry. And they gave them tasks like writing essays and they had three groups, those that use the chat GPT say, those that just use Google and those that use the brain only. And then they measured, and some of the results were pretty, pretty shocking. For example, the neural connections that you use in thinking to do the task go way down when you're using, you know, chat GPT. Um, they found that 80, over 83% of the people who finished an essay when they used chat GPT couldn't remember anything about it just minutes later compared to 10% for people using, you know, Google and their brain. But here's the, um, and also lack of original thinking, people were, unlikely to uh, be skeptical they, of what chat GPT or whatever the language model was that they were giving them and they would just go with the angle you know, that they gave them. But here's some of the really scary things. Cognitive atrophy. So basically people who were habitual users of it when they were given a task, okay, don't use it, use it, they, they couldn't do the mm. task. But people who use their brain normally and use it, you know, occasionally or as assistant, they were, they didn't ex see the same atrophy. So you want to jump in there? Yeah, just, I read that same study and that's exactly what stuck out to me too, is like the most interesting portion, in my opinion, of this whole study was actually the last step in it, right? So they had these people write these essays for X amount of months, X number of essays. At the very end, they asked them to rewrite the first essay that they composed, right? So the group that used ChatGPT is basically at a loss, right? And, and the constraint of this final task being that you can't use, you know, previous like reference material, right? You have to do it in an original way. So you ask ChatGPT to do that. It's like, well, you know, crickets, what can you do really? But the people who were actively using their brains could recall what they had done and had since 
researched additional topics, whatever, and could improve upon their original work. They learned. It stuck with them. So, so on that note, part of the, the atrophy is that, uh, so chat GPT or whatever it is might make you, they, they say 60% faster at doing whatever task, but it actually reduces something called your germane cognitive load. So that's the mental effort used to understand and actually learn something to do it by 32%. So basically, you think you're being more efficient, but in the end, you're losing brain capacity, essentially. So you're overall going to be less efficient well, you as know, a human. Well, th that's what I wanted to ask you, because like, you really do see the both sides of it. Like, I've been listening uh, for over the last several weeks to like, uh, podcasts and, video, and I've been watching videos of um, kind of like the frontiers of math and science. And the people who are like on the sort of forefront of new scientific inquiries and, and math, they're really like excited about what AI is offering. Like I, I watched a great video about how AI was used to um, classify protein structures, whereas before it would take like an endless amount of time for humans to do it. A AI was able to come in and like do, uh, I forgot how many, but like hundreds of thousands, whereas humans over the last like 50 years were able to do like dozens, you know, uh, which has a, a ton of uh, implications for medicine and, and, and a lot of uh, positive things. Can I point to one quick thing on that? Mm -hmm. So there was this, they're really beautiful images. I will have to call them up on screen. But um, so there was a piece of a mouse brain recently fully mapped in its entirety, right? The neurons, the structure, everything. And the thing is, when you look at this image, it looks like a beautiful, in-depth, like twisting forest. It's really incredible, right? And exactly what you said, you know, this is done with, the high tech computing that we previously would not have had access to. Oh. So there are great scientific benefits. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me what the mouse's brain looked like after you used right, to right, right. <laughs> well, so my, my point How was that, get like, through the maze? <laughs> like, like, like both in, in the physics and math, oh, ma math is probably going to have huge advancements over the next several years because of AI. And so, but then when I listen to those podcasts, those individuals speaking on those podcasts, they're like in their 40s, 50s. So they've had a huge amount of time where they've been like deep thinking and you know they're obviously super intelligent they've you know they're uh, they're they've thought about these problems for dozens of years you know they're very smart people so for them this is a great tool to advance things and so that's that but i but then you have the other side which is more the consumer facing side and that's when you have like kids who aren't learning properly and like just everyday people who are growing up with these things and they're they're not going to be able to grow up to be like these mathematicians and scientists because they're not having to tackle these large problems on their own maybe not you'll always have like you know it, it'll be a, a spread right like at the, at the tail end you'll always have geniuses and and in, intelligent people but the entire bell curve might be lowered because of chat gpt and, and these types of ais so i wonder if it's almost like alcohol where it's like like it has its place in society but maybe like it should be regulated to not let, let kids use it but then if you have like things like dynamic pricing it's just going to be like so ubiquitous throughout society maybe that's not even re like realistic to say that you limited a couple of points on that first of all okay on the dynamic pricing front i think most people can safely rest assured that we're not going to see this in your local store quite so soon uh full disclosure kroger and walmart are doing pilot programs and do expect to see electronic you know, so digital price readouts. I thought you say, I thought you say full disclosure. I, I, have a, I have a financial stake in one of these companies. Okay, we can continue, please. However, um, those individual price units, right, the digital ones, they cost a lot of money. Mm. So it's unlikely we're going to be seeing that in a super widespread way very, very soon. Don't we already okay? see it at the but gas pump? There are instances, obviously. You know, retailers have been doing it for some time. Any too. online shopping does it. Yes. So. Right. All right, Shelby, leave us with something positive. Positive okay. note. I would completely agree with you in the sense that, in my view, right, AI is a great tool, but it's exactly that. It's a tool. It's meant to be used to facilitate, you know, the human growth learning, right? Like, use your brain, right? Don't let something else think for you. And ultimately, I think the point is this, like, you don't want to give that humanness away. You don't want to lose your ability to experience the world through learning, right? If you lose that, what exactly are we? The point that you made, <laughs> right, earlier about the study for MIT, there are other points about it as well, such as the fact that ChatGPT users typically have more loneliness than those who don't, which is kind of along the same line of like, you know, where is our humanity really going if we're overusing these things, right? So I think the biggest positive takeaway you can gain from this kind of thing is just 
you know, let's use it for what it should be used for. Let's use it as the tool to further our own ability to develop and to have great social interactions and to, you know, come up with these discoveries on our own, right? I totally agree. All right, I know exactly what you're thinking. That was a great clip you just watched. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to follow and also check out either these videos or maybe they're on this side, I don't know which side they're on, but we set it up. So these are the videos that YouTube is suggesting to you as the best ones that you'll probably like the most. So check them out, this side, this side.